it's almost May and we're still running on snow. What's up everybody, good morning, how are you? Today I am running around, I guess, the Patterson Lake area um, and trying to do something a little bit different. We're gonna take the show on the trail. <laughs> We're gonna be talking today about SL2R, specifically the concrete representations thereof. I promise you this, it took me a while to figure it out, uh, how to tell the story anyway, and I'm splitting it into two parts, but today is the first part, so let's get into it. When I talked about representations of SL2R, I promised that I would give you kind of a concrete representation, something you could play with, something you could build, something that wasn't just some abstract <laughs> lattice points on a plane. Um, and so today, I like to go over one of those. Um, but first, we need to kind of talk about the simple harmonic oscillator algebra, uh, or something I'm gonna be calling A. A is pretty straightforward, right? You might recall, it's spanned by three elements, A, a dagger and one were the identity operator and it basically obeys one non-trivial commutator which is to say that a with a dagger is equal to one um, it's the simplest incarnation possible i guess of a heisenberg algebra and conveniently it's also used to describe the physics of the quantum harmonic oscillator which is incredibly important for the study of quantum field theory at this point, it might also be worth reminding ourselves about SL2R, the algebra itself. Remember, it's also spanned by three elements. These elements are L plus, L minus, and L zero. And the commutation relations are also pretty simple. Um, L zero with L plus or minus is just plus or minus L plus or minus. And L plus with L minus gives us minus two L zero, which is very similar to SU2, uh, as you might recall, but, but for that minus sign. Um, we also studied previously uh, the Bargman representations, which were kind of sketched in the QM plane, and we had these two bounding parabolas that told us where the unitary regions of the plane were and where the non-unitary regions of the plane were, uh, and we had representations being basically semi-infinite and infinite lattices um, in one dimension uh, on that plane. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention, there's a really great like, concrete realization of the simple os oscillator algebra, A. Um, you can think of it in terms of monomials in some formal variable, say, Z. Uh, so you can think of a dagger, or the creation operator is just Z, the variable, and uh, A, the annihilation operator, as D by DZ. And so their commutator obviously gives you one. Um, from that perspective, the oscillator algebra modules, uh, which we've discussed, I guess, in detail before, but if not, we'll do it again, um, are easily represented in terms of, you know, uh, monomials in Z, just like with, with a dagger. The vacuum you can think of as just the constant one. So in other words, constant numbers represent the vacuum in this representation. And that makes sense because they're annihilated by a derivative, right? So it's very nice. And there is, in some sense, there's a deep relationship between the oscillator algebra uh, and kind of the space of harmonic functions. But that is a whole nother story. Since I brought it up, I may as well go there. For those of you who've studied partial differential equations, you might be familiar with uh, the Laplacian operator, uh, which in various contexts 
essentially amounts to kind of like the rotationally invariant thing. You know, sometimes they're presented by triangle uh, d by dx squared plus d by dy squared plus d by dz squared for you three-dimensional physicist types. Um, we have been talking a lot about SL2Z, which is obviously a subgroup of SL2R, and its actions is re relevant to the modular group and, and how it acts um, on the upper half plane of the complex numbers. Well, SL2R also acts on the upper half plane of the complex numbers in the same way, in the sense that uh, the upper half plane is stable um, under actions of SL2R, it preserves the upper half plane. As it turns out, the Laplacian for functions on the upper half plane uh, is uh, given by this thing, um, which, you know, it, it's the, it assumes a metric that's non-Euclidean. Um, it turns out eigenfunctions of, the, of this particular Laplacian are harmonic on the upper half plane, and as the Laplacian is kind of specifically designed to preserve symmetries, uh, because the upper half plane is invariant under SL2R, the Laplacian, um, in some sense, is as well. And so, to form a representation of SL2R, you can simply look at eigenfunctions of the Laplacian operator. Uh, and in particular, you can look at harmonic functions, those uh, with eigenvalue zero. <laughs> um, solutions, if you like, to Laplace's equation. And what we find there is kind of a basis, if you like, for the algebra um, in, this, in this representation, uh, a module, if you like, is, is represented similarly um, by monomials. So, for example, one, z, d by dz, but also z bar and dz d by d z bar. <laughs> um, and the fact that it looks so suspiciously similar to the kind of uh, module for the simple oscillator algebra suggests strongly that we should be able to construct an SL2R module uh, out of the harmonic oscillator um, module as well. And it turns out that's mostly true. And we'll see that not today, but a bit later. I might regret this. It's like the littlest ridge in the history of ridges. Uh, it must be like the Groomer Trail or something. So it turns out, yes, you can build an SL2R module out of the oscillator, simple oscillator algebra module. Um, and if you follow this channel, you know that we've already done it implicitly. And we talked about a non-unitary representation of SU2. Indeed, Hideki Yukawa in 1956 created a representation of SU11, which is basically SL2R, um, uh, using the um, creation and annihilation operators of the oscillator algebra. Uh, for that, uh, we chose L plus to be one half a dagger a dagger, L minus to be one half a a, and L zero to be one half quantity n plus one half. Um, if you work out the Casimir, the Casimir is a constant; it's just three sixteenths. Uh, so we know what the Q values are for the for the representation, and it turns out because um, the uh, L plus operators are. are L plus and L minus operators um, are quadratic in the creation and annihilation operator, so we get these two uh, kind of intertwined um, representations. Um, one uh, starting with uh, the vacuum, so L0 on the vacuum gives you M equals to 1 fourth, and one on the state with one a dagger, which gives you the state with M equal to 3 fourths, and you can just go off by adding more L plus uh, along the way. Um, one thing we didn't discuss there, and so obviously now that we're in SL2R land, <laughs> the, the unitary regions of the QM plane have flipped. So these are now unitary representations, which is awesome. Um, and also we have the kind of dual representations on the other side of that parabola bound. Um, and to do that, we simply need to use the involution, um, the same <laughs> SL2 involution that we've been talking about in the vertex operator algebra series, the sigma one involution, uh, which basically just flips L plus and L minus and uh, flips the sign of L0. You can quickly work out that indeed also gives you a representation of SL2R. Um, the net effect of which is that it naturally acts on kind of the dual space um, of 
uh, oscillator states and um, has eigenvalues minus m. So for this particular case, we have q equals 3 sixteenths, but m equals to minus 1 fourth and minus 3 fourths. Neat. <laughs> say, Sean, are there other representations of SL2R besides the Q th equals 3 sixteenths and 1 fourth and 3 fourths um, hiding using the oscillator algebra? And the answer to that is kind of. <laughs> so um, around the early 90s, there's a bunch of work on this from a bunch of different folks uh, and a bunch of you know physics folks who are interested for like optics reasons in SU11, which is of course isomorphic to SL2R. Uh, and one paper in particular by um, Hirayama and Yamakoshi comes to mind, uh, wherein they constructed a whole mess of ways to do it, almost as an afterthought. They were they were interested in quantum groups, some other stuff. But um, but let me just recount uh, kind of the simplest version of their of their construction here. So um, consider the operator alpha, which is equal to some function f of n, the number operator a dagger a, times a. Then we have of course a dagger, which is um, the Hermitian conjugate of that, which is a dagger uh, f of n. Um, you might worry about it being f bar, but it turns out everything's um, Hermitian, it's real, and is, and is a Hermitian operator, so, so everything's fine. So you can compute their commutator, uh, you know, a alpha dagger with alpha, and lo and behold, you get something that's proportional to minus 2n, <laughs> you know, and, and, and some other junk, um, which is very interesting. Now, they go through this whole song and dance to build this function of n and, and, and show what you can do with it, but I, I'll just tell it to you straight. In this case, the function of n is, looks kind of complicated. It's the square root uh, of some, some pair of po polynomial functions um, uh, divided by 1 plus n. Uh, you compute the commutator of alpha dagger with alpha, and lo and behold, look what you get. Right? Which looks suspiciously, suspiciously like it should be a representation of SL2R. And indeed, if you define L0 uh, to be parameterized in a similar sor sort of way, that is to say n plus, say, some m value, <laughs> you do in fact, you can check the commutator. So now we can, we can say alpha dagger is L plus, alpha is L minus, and L0 is n plus some constant m, and here's that function m, f. Uh, compute the commutators, you get SL2R. Awesome. Even better. Compute the quadratic Casimir and look what you get. That other parameter that was kind of like lurking around, another weird constant thing, right? So if we identify that constant with Q, then M has the obvious implication of being the, the kind of the highest weight, right? So now let's act on L0, excuse me, let's act with L0 on our harmonic oscillator basis. And what do we find? <laughs> yeah, easy, right? Um, so uh, alpha will annihilate the vacuum, of course, because there's an A, but L0 uh, acting on that vacuum gives us the eigenvalue M. So in some sense, it's the lowest weight state um, of an SL2R representation with Q value, this mess, which we can just fix to be some value of Q, whatever Q we want, uh, and M is given there. Interesting. Of course, we can do the dual construction as well, as per the usual involution, and get minus M. So, in some sense, what we've created here is uh, a concrete construction of the discrete series of Bargman's kind of representations. Now, I know what you're thinking. We have to be careful about our values of Q and M in order to present unitarity. So let's look at how unitarity works into this case. It's a little scary. I say that every time I run this. <laughs> it's always fine. Let's look at the square root of, in this case, it's going to be n plus m quantity squared plus n plus m plus q, right? So clearly, if we don't choose our q and m values correctly, we're going to have an imaginary number in the square root, which means we're no longer in a unitary region because the states are no longer normalized in terms of the inner product in a positive definite way. So something very interesting happens when we act with alpha on the state, say, uh, one, the A takes care of that 
dagger and brings us to the state zero, the vacuum. And F has now evaluated the vacuum. And we see that we get the square root of M squared plus M plus Q. Hopefully that quantity is familiar to you. The vanishing of that quantity gives us one of the two bounding parabolas uh, for the unitary regions of the QM plane. Uh, and so with a dual space, you can construct the, similarly the, the other parabola. And lo and behold, you get your constraints on unitarity. Namely, in a very natural way, alpha annihilates not the vacuum, but the state one, the one particle state. Um, uh, for you know reasons of unitarity, just like happened with Bargman's uh, representations. So indeed, we can in fact basically identify now these uh, kind of discrete modules of SL2R with the Bargman series for, in this case, k less than one fourth, right, and appropriate values of m that lie on that on that parabola. And of course, there's that exceptional series where we can pick two values of m if we want to, but. Yeah, whatever. Okay. I know what you're thinking. Sean, can we construct the continuous series, please? How do we do that? The continuous series, of course, is a one-dimensional lattice that has both positive and negative values. How do you go about that if you have to worry about annihilating a vacuum? That is an excellent question. As it turns out, the answer is complicated, somewhat, and is out of the scope for today. We will come back to it. We will talk about it because the resolution is interesting. It's at least worth covering because there's a lot of nonsense flying around in the literature, at least on the physics side. Um, uh, kind of sweeping this part under the rug and uh, it's not a good thing to do <laughs> so um, anyway continuous series next time probably oh god now I gotta get home <laughs>